my friends. Happy Friday. I hope everybody's having a, an amazing Friday and I'm super duper excited because today we're going to talk about one of my all-time favorite cases and that would be the case of John Bonnet Ramsey which to this day remains unsolved. John Bonnet was born August 6, 1990 to parents John Ramsey and her mother Patricia Ramsey. She was actually not a native of Colorado by birth. She was actually born in Atlanta as her parents were from Atlanta. Growing up, Jean Benet was a very bubbly girl and um, Patsy right away sensed that Jean Benet can be in pageants. Patsy was a former beauty queen from West Virginia and Jean Benet's father, John, was a really prominent wealthy businessman who owned a computer graphics company and he did really well. The family purchased a home during John Bonnet's early childhood. This would be before kindergarten. And it was a 15 bedroom mansion in Boulder, Colorado. So that right there can let you know these people are pretty wealthy and well off. Jomini's mother Patsy actually would enter her in beauty pageants all the time and Patsy would go on to say that this was not something that she would have to force Jomini to do that Jomini would really thrive during these you know pageants and something that she really got excited to do with Patsy. Um, Jomini would go on to win several beauty pageant titles including Miss America Little Miss America Royale and also Little Miss Colorado and things were looking really positive for John Bonet. You know, she was living a really great life. She had an older brother, Burke, who she adored, and they would always play together. And she had a really good, you know, picturesque family. The way that Patsy would portray them, I mean, this woman would go all out. She would do pre recorded, you know, like Christmas cards to send to people where she would be propped up with John and John Bonet and Little Burke and her house was, I mean, decorated to the nines. She had every single thing you could ever need or want for Christmas, this woman. You could definitely see that Patsy was consumed with imagery. Like she really cared about presenting this image to people that she was this really well-off woman. She had the perfect family. She was the perfect wife. And you can really get a sense from that from watching several clips of Patsy. Everything she did, she made sure it was perfect. And it's kind of narcissistic in a way because Patsy, you get the sense, most people believe Patsy had everything about her. Like the pageants people say weren't really John Bonet's love. There's people who say that Patsy was living through John Bonet. Then the house, like everything always had to be pristine. There was nannies who said that Patsy really would get so upset if the kid, you know, little John Bonet would wet the bed or even, you know, spill a drink. And it's kind of weird that Patsy would get so angry about those type of things considering the fact that she had a nanny and a maid who did all the cleaning and work for her. So it's like, why are you getting so mad? You know what I mean? That's kind of weird right there. Like she has zero patience, she gets mad over things she doesn't even have to clean up. I mean, poor John Bonet. Like you would think when you pee on yourself in your bed, you're gonna be upset and tell your mom like, "Mom, oh my God," I'm, or be crying. And Patsy's already pissed the second she gets in the room and sees it. And I mean, we've all been there. Like I have kids, and my kids have wet the bed, and I've been upset, but not to the point where. I'm like super pissed or punishing them for it. Like I'll just be like, oh my God, like don't do that again. And I don't even have maids and stuff to clean up the mess. So I don't know why Patsy would get so extreme about that. A lot of people find that questionable. And 
I mean, it is something to think about. So John Bonet is actually found dead on December 26th, 1996 in her Boulder, Colorado home. And the way that this morning starts off is Patsy walks down their spiral staircase as she says she did every morning. And that's where she would go to get down the stairs to the kitchen to make coffee and just get ready for the day. Patsy claims as she's walking down the spiral staircase that she comes across these three pages at the bottom of the steps. When she picks them up, she realizes it's this ransom note and the ransom note is really, really odd. It says it's written by a foreign faction and they're demanding the exact amount of money that actually is Patsy's husband John's Christmas bonus. Like that right there was the first thing I was thinking. I'm like, wait a second. How would a foreign faction know the exact amount of money John's getting for his Christmas bonus? Like, this guy's a millionaire, billionaire, whatever, and they are just demanding his Christmas bonus. So right there, that hit me like, hmm, I don't know about that part being, you know, a criminal, a real criminal. And the note would go on to say things like, please bring a adequate attache to the bank and just really, really weird wording, really weird choice of words. I mean, what criminal talks like that? And it would go on to say, you know, don't grow a brain now on us, John. Use your good Southern common sense. It's like, how many people from Boulder knew John was from the South? Like, I'm sure that that could be looked up or maybe was written somewhere. But I just find it odd that somebody would include that. It almost sounds like a self-absorbed note, like the author is making it more about themselves and including details about themselves. Like, think about it. John's bonus was in there. You know, John being a Southerner's in there. Then it said, if you want your daughter to have a proper burial, and Patsy and John were self-proclaimed Christians who were supposedly very religious and involved in church. And I mean... I don't know. That was a really odd ransom note. And then it signed SBTC Victory. Nobody to this day knows what exactly SBTC stands for. There's a lot of people who say that that phrase is just made up by John and Patsy to cover their asses. And some people say it's even written like a movie script. Like there's lines that were from movies, allegedly. And so I don't know. What do you guys think about that ransom note? Patsy phones the police after reading this ransom note and she's hysterical. She's on the phone screaming, saying that there's been a kidnapping. There's people who have my daughter. She's not here. And it's really weird because in the ransom note, the ransom note tells Patsy, don't contact police. If you contact police, your daughter dies. If you contact anybody, Patsy, daughter dies. Tell me how Patsy calls the freaking police, doesn't even tell them to be discreet because the note says that her daughter will die if they're contacted. Then after getting off the telephone with police, she goes on to call all of her friends and family, the pastor, I mean, everybody's coming to her house. So not only did she do one thing the note tells her not to do, she goes on to call more attention to herself and the house, inviting everybody over. A lot of people wonder if this was an intentional act by Patsy to contaminate the crime scene essentially and just cover her tracks even more. When the police arrive at the scene, it's only said that one detective arrives and that one detective is Alinda Arndt and she arrives to a chaotic crime scene with all these people there. There's this three page ransom note so she's like freaking out because she's never been on a case like this before. She doesn't know, you know, the extent of what goes on during something like this. So she's just really trying to keep it cool and, you know, be there for these people while this is going on. As some time passes, well, before this, they search the house and the police, there's the wine cellar door and they say that they could not get this door open at that time and it was the only room that wasn't searched. Which you would think if you're gonna clear a house, you have to clear every single room. Like the police should have really kicked that door down because how can you leave 
or do anything further if you did not clear every single space in that house. That right there, they screwed up from the jump. Like they didn't even secure the crime scene. They didn't clear the home because they didn't search every room. I mean, so many mistakes were made so early on in this case that it's impossible to say exactly what could have been different or should have been different that would have had a different outcome for John Benet. And after this time passes, you know, Linda sees that the guests and John and Patsy are all getting really anxious and pacing back and forth, just being, you know, what you would think, anxious. Although she does say that John was casually reading his mail up in his study during this time, not really waiting for a phone call, not really asking any questions or acting too concerned. She thought that that was odd. She describes John's behavior that whole day just as being extremely cordial and she's been interviewed several times and that's the only word she can seem to come up with when describing John is he's cordial. So, I mean, people do grieve in different ways and people do, do show nervousness and feelings in their own way, but she thought particularly that his behavior was extremely odd. Linda goes on while she's there to make a critical mistake that is highly criticized in this whole thing. And that was that she told family and friends to go ahead and search the rest of the house to keep themselves busy. Well, she says immediately during this time, John goes straight for the basement and that's where he discovers John Benet. His friend Fleet White was with him when he discovers John Benet and he tells police that before John even turned the light on to that little basement room where John Benet was, that he says, I found her. And a lot of people speculate that how could he have seen he found her when she was under a blanket and it was super dark in there. Like, how could he say he found her before turning the light on? Was it possible he could see? How would he know that that was her under the blanket? I don't know. Fleet obviously thought that was weird enough to, you know, comment about to the police. And I agree. And so he comes out with John Bonet and immediately Linda Arndt is like, what the fuck? Like, oh my God, this she's like freaking out at this point she's thinking like i can't believe he just came out with his daughter and he's carrying her now removed her from the crime scene which linda you shouldn't have let them search it anyway but that was a rookie mistake and you know she tells him immediately to bring her up to the upper level and set her down and during this time when he was kneeling down linda ex explains that they shared this nonverbal, you know thing between them and she says right when she looks in John's eyes that she knows that the killer is still in this house. And she says she's consciously counting all of her rounds and her gun because she didn't know if they would all make it out alive. So right from that, you can conclude that she really believed that John was the killer in that moment. And she was convinced of this. I mean, have you ever shared like a eye lock with somebody and you get this instant vibe like, they're good, they're bad, they're silly, whatever it is. Like, to me, that was pretty weird for her to say, like she had to have sensed something in his energy that day that would give her that type of perception about him. So, and the fact that he went straight for that room and announced he found her before he even turns on the light, I mean, she has good reason. So right after the murders, the same day actually, it was said that John was actually trying to catch a flight to Atlanta the same day because he had supposed business that he had to take care of over there, you know, regarding his work. And a lot of people, they're, th they're thinking like, no, this guy did not have business. Like, he's the owner of this business. The owner don't work the, the day after Christmas. So a lot of people were thinking he just wants to get out of here and avoid police. And the police tell John right away, they're like, dude, you can't go nowhere. Like, there's a murder investigation going on. We need you here. We need to question you. We're searching this house. You know, no, you can't leave. And right from the jump, police were really suspicious of the Ramses and didn't buy the whole intruder theory and really thought that John and Patsy authored the ransom note to cover up the murder of John Bonet. 
The note was tested against several different handwriting and it, Patsy Ramsey basically, she could never be ruled out as being the author of the note on three different scales, which is really odd. And another thing about the ransom note was that it was actually written on one of Patsy's notepads because they found a draft of the note in the trash can. And it was written with Patsy's pens. So a lot of people are thinking, why would a killer sit in your house, use your pen and paper and write a three page ransom note? Like this person was comfortable enough to sit there and take the time to write out this three page and loose like crazy ransom note. And a lot of people don't buy it and they still believe to this day that Patsy was the writer and that John was the one telling her what to write. Like, because they had a professional guy come in who specializes in this type of thing and he said that he believed the note was directed by a man and written by a woman. Basically, John telling Patsy what to write. So it's around the same time when John Bonet is going to the corner to have her medical examination and they discover unknown DNA in John Bonet's underwear and on her waistband of her pants she had on that night. And this DNA was still, you know, they couldn't match it to anybody in the house. So, I mean, who knows where it came from? It could have just been trace DNA. Like they said, trace DNA could come from someone touching it as shipping or when it was packaged up in the factory or store, who knows? but it didn't match anyone in the house. And the um, coroner said that her official cause of death was asphyxiation due to strangulation. And she was strangled with a garrote. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's like this, you can make it, it's like a knotted torture device on a stick. And in John Bonet's case, it was actually used one of Patsy's paint brushes that she had broken into ha in half and it was used to strangle John Bonet with that little rope knot that was on there. And she also had a huge fracture in her skull, which was super, super bad. And she had these marks on her body and on her cheek, it almost looked as if it was like two taser marks. The Ramses were interviewed many on many different occasions and appeared on several different local television stations as well as well-known TV shows. And whenever they would appear on TV trying to appeal to the public, a lot of people would feel like they were insincere. They never, you know, really believed them. And a part of this, I think, is because on many occasions, John would be looking over to Patsy, like almost telling her what to say or cutting her off and not letting her talk at all. And also, you know, a lot of times Patsy looked like kind of out of it like if you go and google some of her videos for interviews she's completely out of it and if they are innocent you know it could be she was taking antidepressants to self-medicate and cope with what was going on but I guess whenever you're on tv like that and you're under public scrutiny and people see you looking loopy and not really being able to get your point across well and not really being able to form a sentence, they get rubbed wrong and they suspect you. And that's definitely what happened with the Ramses. You know, they were under public scrutiny from the very beginning. People thought that they were just these wealthy people who were able to buy their way out of jail time. And that particular, you know, image of them is still really, you know, here today. A lot of people to this day really do still believe that they paid their way out of jail. The perpetrator will be found. You know, America has just been hurt so deeply with the, the, the tragic things that have happened. The young woman who drove her children into the water and we don't know what happened with the O.J. Simpson and I mean, America is suffering because they they have lost faith in the American. So John Bonet's autopsy finally comes back, and it's particularly disturbing. It shows that she actually died from asphyxiation due to strangulation, which, as we all know, she was strangled with that garrote, 
and she also had craniocerebral trauma. She had a fracture, which was from the fracture that was running down her skull, and they believe that that was caused by blunt force trauma to the head. Now, it's also important to realize that poor John Bonet was also found to have had chronic vaginal, you know, inflammation and damage. So even if she was sexually assaulted the night of her murder, this was chronic, which means that she was already being sexually abused prior to her actual death, which is incredibly sad and heartbreaking to think about what this little girl had to go through in her short life, you know. She also had bound wrists and she had some markings that almost looked like they could be from a taser or something like that. They never officially said that, but there were other detectives who were thinking that those marks on her face were from a taser. So in 1999, a grand jury actually did vote to indict the Ramses on two counts of child neglect and abuse that resulted in the death of their six-year-old daughter, John Bonet. So this looked like a real win for the police at this time, and people in the media were really excited that what they thought to be true was coming to light. Now, the indictment didn't exactly accuse the Ramses of murder, but instead, it said that they were responsible for her death due to negligence and child abuse, which is interesting. Like, I still wonder what the indictment paper said, but I don't think they will ever release that to us to be able to sit there and read the 13 page indictment on them. But it would be interesting to do so. Well, Things didn't go exactly as we all thought at that time because the district attorney at that time, Alex Hunter, actually reversed the decision of the grand jury and decided to not indict the Ramses on the murder. Now we're at almost to the end of this video, so I want to discuss some theories and see which one you guys think is more probable and what you believe. So the first theory is obviously the theory of an intruder, a foreign faction, going in and killing JonBenet and leaving the ransom note. A lot of people believe in this theory that it could have possibly been a, you know, person who was at one of her beauty pageants or maybe anyone who came to one of Patsy's many Christmas parties where she had over a thousand people in her house at a time. The theory is that Patsy was so enraged with John Bonet's bedwetting that she hit her upside the head and to cover the murder, finished it off with the strangulation and all of that. The last theory and the one that I find the most probable and interesting would be the theory that Burke actually had a hand in his sister's murder. And this theory goes that the pineapple that was in the kitchen the day that she was found was actually some pineapple that he was eating that night. And the theory says that John Bonet comes down and messes with him the way brothers and sisters play, or maybe took a pineapple from him and in a fit of rage, he picks up the metal flashlight, which by the way, the Ramsey say was not theirs and hits her upside the head or throws it at her and that's what causes that crack in her skull and to cover it up john and patsy write this note because they were so afraid of messing up their perfect image and if you believe that patsy and john were narcissistic and only cared about their image then this theory would really be backed by that idea that they covered it even though he wouldn't have necessarily got jail time because he was so young they covered it to protect their own image because john didn't want to lose everything because it's likely if the company found out they would elect a new ceo and he wouldn't be involved at all anymore because they wouldn't want you know the father of a child murderer you know representing them and patsy you already know she would not want to ruin her perfect wife and mother personally find the one about burke to be the most probable if you guys have any other theories or information please please comment down below and let me know which one you think happened 